Well, as I've already told you, we're going to be looking today at the parable of the sower. So what I'd like to do is read the parable and read its explanation. And I uh, want you to understand this morning, we're really just focusing on one small part of it. This evening, we'll look a little bit more at it. But we're looking at that idea of fruit and fruitfulness because Jesus says that the seed that falls in the good soil bears fruit, and that is really what distinguishes it from the other soils, which we believe represent non-conversion. Uh, so let me just read the parable, and then we'll uh, talk about this fruit, what exactly this fruit is, where it comes from, because at least with regard to, the, uh, to this parable, this is how we distinguish the believer from the unbeliever, is fruit. Okay. So let's begin by reading Matthew chapter 13, and it's verses 1 through 23. We read this, That day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. And large crowds gathered to him, so he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus answered them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, This is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Well, again, we're going to focus just on that last verse and really just the point on what is this fruit that Jesus is talking about. Because, again, this is what distinguishes the believer from the unbelievers. So I think it's important for us, especially when the enemy is going to attack our assurance, and try to take it away from us, uh, it's important for us to understand what it is we should be looking for in our lives to know that we really belong to Jesus. Well, may the Lord again give us grace as we do a very quick overview of this because this is a huge, really a huge subject. A lot has been written on this. Now, just by way of review, so far we've seen that we are in a war with a being who hates us And he wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy us because we are God's image. But he can't destroy us because God will not let him do so. But he can stumble us. 
He can weaken us. And he tries to do it in a variety of ways. Uh, he may attack directly, though that's very unlikely. Since Satan can only be in one place at a time, it's very unlikely he would attack us directly unless we happen to be somebody very special or doing something very important for the Lord. Well, he also has an army of demons, uh, a vast host, and certainly they are interacting with us, trying to stumble us as well. He mainly uses the world, you know, the things that are in the world that entice us, that get us to get our eyes off of heaven and onto the world, the things that will make us desire things that we shouldn't desire. Uh, again, the, uh, the idea of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life that will draw us away from the Lord. And of course, Satan also knows that he has an internal ally within each one of us called the flesh, that remaining corruption that is left over. We're not absolutely pure. And that makes us vulnerable to what Satan is doing, particularly in the world, because that sin within us makes us want what he wants. It's the very thing that Paul said he was struggling with in Romans chapter 7. Uh, the sin that uh, you know, he finds himself doing things that he really doesn't want to do. And he describes the same struggle for us in Galatians chapter 5 as the spirit and the flesh basically warring against one another. This is what makes us vulnerable to the enemy's attacks. Now, as we know, the enemy's goal is to weaken us, stumble us, that he might weaken us, that he might weaken our love, our love for the Lord, our love for holy things, and so our faith. Now, one thing we need to understand is the relationship between love and faith, the, the love the Spirit of God gives to us. When he gives us that love, that is what creates the faith that is within us. Paul says to the Galatians that faith works through love. And I think essentially what he means by that is that when our eyes are open to the beauty of the Lord and our hearts are drawn out to him, we trust him. We love him. So that work of the Spirit that enables us to trust in Jesus is really the love that he gives us for the Lord. And, of course, having now trusted in the Lord, having believed, faith enables us to receive everything the Bible says, to receive it as real, as true. And, of course, that love that he gives to us also draws our hearts out to those things, towards those things, and makes us want to do what the Word of God says, what those things are that are pleasing to the Lord. So love gives rise to faith, and of course this love also gives rise to, to good works, to this fruit that our Lord Jesus is talking about. Now, if the devil succeeds in tempting us and getting us to fall, he can weaken that love, he can grieve and quench the Holy Spirit. We actually do that by giving in to that sin. That weakens the love, that weakens the faith. Now, the way he goes about it, as we've seen, is he tries to deceive us. He tries to lie. That's his main weapon. He may try to change the Word of God, change what the standard says. We saw there's various ways in which he does that. He tries to add to the Word of God. He tries to take away from the Word of God. He especially attacks the essentials of the gospel because he knows without those things, we cannot be saved. And that's why we see that in the cults. Virtually all of them have denied something essential to the gospel. Or he may add and take away from the word of God through the belief in the continuance of revelatory gifts, as we've seen. This can undercut what God has said by trying to add to it what he is now saying. And I gave you some examples when we looked at that of people who really do that. Not everybody in the charismatic movement is perhaps as guilty as others in this regard, but... When you rely upon this sensation or feeling or words you think you're hearing, rather than on the Word of God, you are on very dangerous ground. Now, we saw that Satan also tries to change the way we view the standard that we view the Bible. Uh, he can make what the Bible says is bad or sinful actually look good to us. What is forbidden as acceptable. Remember what happened with regard to Eve. We need to be on our guard, be in the Word, know what it says. He can make us question whether this really is the standard, whether it really is God's Word. There's the whole liberal movement. This is, they believe, simply the Word of man. It's not God's Word. It's full of errors. It's a myth. It's not real history. 
Now again, if he can change our mind with regard to the standard, with regard to the word of God, he may get us to fall into sin. And if he gets us to fall into sin, then he will quench and grieve the Holy Spirit. Our love will diminish. And so our faith and our effectiveness in serving the Lord and so then our threat to his kingdom. Now last week we saw he attacks God's revelation about himself in the creation and in the word. He tries to distract us from the greatness of God in the creation what we call his natural perfections. But particularly, he tries to distract us from his holiness, that which makes God truly beautiful, God's love for what is right, for what is good, his love towards us, the fact that he created us and made us, the fact that he's providing for us, the fact that he sent his son to save us and that he will eventually bring us to glory. Now, Satan is trying to hide these things from us. He's trying to get us to stop looking at these things because he knows if he can get us to look away from them and draw our vision instead into the world, he can weaken our love and our faith. So he is constantly at work trying to undermine these things, trying to draw us away from the things that will make the Spirit's work in our lives stronger and towards the things that will weaken it. Sin will weaken his influence. We do need to remember why the Apostle Paul commands us what he does in Ephesians 5.18, to be filled with the Spirit. He says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, don't be under the influence of anything but the Spirit of God. Don't be under the influence of the world. Don't be under the influence. Don't let your soul be filled with desires for these things that will control you. Let the Spirit control you. This is your strongest defense against the enemy, but it's also the way that you will gain the strength you need to serve the Lord in his kingdom the way he calls you. Now, today, we want to consider his attack on our assurance. He makes us question whether or not we really belong to Jesus, whether we're just simply deceiving ourselves. Now, he does this through deception. Again, he does it through lies. He is a liar and the father of lies. And he'll come to you with these suggestions, and I do believe Satan is able to make suggestions. I don't think every evil thought in your head comes from him. There's certainly lots of sin in our souls that will bring these things also to mind. But suggestions like this, God has not forgiven you. You are still in your sins, You were still on your way to judgment. When you stand before him on that day, he's not going to own you. He's not going to welcome you into his kingdom. He's going to say to you, depart, you accursed, into the fire prepared for for the devil and his angels. He doesn't love you. He didn't choose you in eternity. He has passed over you in his mercy. Now, if you have never experienced anything like this, you are unusual because this is something that every believer has to face. Now, the interesting thing is that many in the church today don't have to face this or or don't seem to face it at all because the enemy has already deceived them in a particular way because he has convinced them into thinking that salvation is purely a matter of a decision. You choose to believe what the Bible says is true. You pray the prayer. And if you were sincere in that prayer, then you are saved. And you top that off with with a good helping of when you trust in Jesus, it's really not going to change the way you live anyway. You're going to be the same person you were before. There isn't going to be any change. Now, since faith in their view is simply the belief that you're saved, okay, true saving faith is believing that you are saved because you prayed the prayer. If you question that, That's a lack of faith. You should never question the fact that you're saved, but just go on believing that you're saved. If you, again, have just merely believed the facts and you've prayed the prayer, you're saved, you're safe, and you're on your way to heaven. Well, if you have that kind of a view, you're really not going to be shaken too much with regard to a lack of assurance because you're going to be fully assured that you're going to heaven because you believe the facts and you've prayed this prayer. There's really nothing to challenge you. You step in, you step out according to what you want to do. It's completely in your hands. But the problem with that is the Bible says that if you really are trusting in Jesus, there is a change that takes place. It's a rather significant change. 
It is a change at the very center of your being, a change of heart that shows itself in your life, in the way that you live. And if you don't see that, that's something that we should be concerned about. Now, Jesus once said to a group of, of men who not only believed themselves to be saved, that they believed the truth, they believed they were saved, they believed they were God's people, but they thought they were exemplary in their relationship with the Lord. He essentially told them, you're not even saved. We read in Matthew 23, 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. In other words, Jesus was saying to them, you look good on the outside. You know, you're, you're clean, you're pure, you're holy. People think you're holy. You put on a very good show. But the problem is, you're not holy. You don't love God. Everything you do is for show. You're only hypocrites. You're only acting the part. And so Jesus told them what it is they really needed in verse 26. You blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. What Jesus was saying was that they needed a change of heart. The change that only the Spirit of God could give. They needed this life-giving principle this law of the spirit of life that we read about in Romans chapter 8, they needed that in their souls to give them the power to do the right thing so that this, out, this exterior purity, these good works they were doing might actually come from a right principle that they might actually be holy. Now, when we understand how this works, that, that essentially what Jesus is talking about in the parable of, of the sower is, you know, fruit... That, that isn't just good works, but good works that are motivated by a true love for the Lord Jesus Christ. If we understand that, then how can we not, at least at some point in our lives, question whether or not we have that kind of love in our hearts, especially when we step back and take a look at our lives and we see the many weaknesses that are there? I mean, haven't you ever asked the question to yourself, can I really be saved? And I think you also understand that if we don't answer this question satisfactorily in our own lives, that it will cripple us. We will become so absorbed in our own personal condition that you know, whether or not we're going to make it to heaven or whether we're actually on our way to hell, this will divert us from doing what it is that the Lord actually calls us to do. Because how can we, how can we reach out to others with the gospel if we think that we're still in need of the gospel, how can we evangelize them if we need to be evangelized? How can we serve them in bringing them to safety if we think we're still in danger? We're going to be consumed with our own well-being. So the devil attacks us at this point, and he tries to undermine our assurance because he is trying to cripple us so that we will not be able to serve the Lord as we might otherwise be able to do. By the way, the devil attacks unbelievers here as well. That example I gave you before of decisional Christianity. Yes, we do have to make a choice, but it's not merely a choice. It is a choice that is motivated by the Holy Spirit. There are people who make a choice, and when we have the Holy Spirit, we make a choice, but it's the Lord's choice that enabled us to make that choice. It was the Holy Spirit's work in us that allowed us to trust in Jesus. It's not merely the decision of man. The devil attacks unbelievers at this point. There are many who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, but they are convinced that they do because they made a decision and because they prayed a prayer. As a matter of fact, they will be much more convinced than true believers will be convinced because true believers are under attack by the enemy to try to undermine their assurance, but these who are settled in a false hope, he wants to keep them in that false hope. They're still blind. They can't see their condition. They believe they're better than they are. And so he has them deceived, okay? So the question is for us this morning, how can we know that we belong to him? How can we know that we're not simply deceiving ourselves about whether or not we're truly believers? 
or we are, maybe we are true believers and we're struggling with whether or not we really belong to Jesus because of these attacks of the enemy. What is it that we should be looking for in our lives? Now, I'm assuming here that we're already looking to Jesus. You know, there is the question, how does one gain assurance? Well, some would answer the question, if you lack assurance, look to Jesus. And when, if you do, you'll gain assurance. And others are saying, well, no, the question isn't whether or not I've looked to Jesus. I believe I'm looking to Jesus. The question now is, have I looked savingly to Jesus? Or am I only deceiving myself like the person who makes the choice and who prays the prayer? How can I know that I belong to Jesus? Well, we know it's not enough simply to believe that the gospel is true, that Jesus lived, he died in order to save all who trust in him. That, that again, would, would be, it's part of the gospel. We have to believe these things. We have to know the gospel. We have to believe it's true. But there's more. We need to trust in Jesus. It's not enough to pray the prayer. Although if you pray the prayer and you're trusting in Jesus, you will be saved. It's not enough to believe that because you believe the facts and have prayed the prayer, that you are saved. That's not what saving faith really is, the belief that you are saved. Saving faith is actually trusting in Jesus. And let me add this as well. It's not enough to be a child of believing parents. I know that in, in these circles, that sometimes that's all that the minister looks to. Were you born in a, in a believing household? Well, then I've, I've heard ministers say this, pastors say this. I've had arguments with them at some length about it then you are elect and you are regenerate and you are going to be glorified and so forth. Well, that, that's absurd. I mean, because how many, how many children have been born and raised in Christian households and yet have not embraced the Lord Jesus Christ? They have the, all the privileges, they have the knowledge, but they still need that saving work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. So these things are not enough. You do need the Spirit's saving work in the heart to be saved. But here's one more thing you need. You can actually have that work, but still not know that you have that work. That's why you struggle with assurance. You need to be able to see the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart, or you won't have this assurance, the kind of assurance that you need. Now, Jesus, as I've already mentioned, refers to the Spirit's work, this work of the Holy Spirit in this parable as fruit. If we're saved, if we're trusting in Jesus, if that seed has gone into the good soil which has been prepared by the Holy Spirit, has germinated, it will bear fruit. And that fruit, I believe Jesus is talking about here, is the fruit of good works, the fruit of obedience. But we've already seen in the scribes and Pharisees that you can seem to have this kind of fruit in your life. I mean, do you not know people that go to church and and do good things for other people, serve other people, even or maybe kinder than we are to other people, more generous. And yet when you talk to them, they really don't know the Lord. I, they can be like scribes and Pharisees, right? I mean, you, can, you can be clean on the outside, but, but not have the reality. Uh, you can have this fruit, but still not be really the Lord's. You also need to have the right heart. You also need to have the right motive behind what you do. You also need to love, and you need to know that that love is what is moving you, motivating you to do what it is that you're doing. Now again, this is not just any kind of love, because unbelievers love, okay? Unbelievers can love, unbelievers can love unbelievers. Jesus talks about that, that they love those who love them. That's usually the way it works. Unbelievers can love their family members. They can lay down their lives for family members. They, you know, how many mothers have, have died to, to save an infant, right, who weren't converted at all? They love, they, they are, you know, care, they're concerned. So what kind of love are we talking about here? Because it's, it's not something that we're born with. It's something that comes from above. Well, Paul describes this love in Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23, where he says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. 
Now, it may not be apparent on, on the surface because perhaps some of these things are wrapped up in the kind of love unbelievers also have, but we do need to understand there is something that sets it apart, and, and that is, if I can put it this way, it is a love for holiness, a love for true purity and true righteousness, a love for the character of God to see these various fruits, and, and really there's only one fruit of the Spirit here, and that is love. Jonathan Edwards, I thought, did a great job of pointing out how all these different other words, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, these are all simply the application of love to various situations. Uh, love is that, that fruit of the Spirit, and it, it, it contains the elements of self-sacrifice that you might find in, in the other kind of love, but it contains something else that that kind of love doesn't have, and that is a love for the moral purity of God. It is a love that will make you love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength because He is holy, not just because He is great. If He were great but not holy, He would not be the object of your love. You would be deathly afraid of Him. It is His holiness that makes Him beautiful, and that holiness is what you will love. That also will give you a love towards your neighbor. You will love your neighbor as yourself because the one you love commands you to do that and because your neighbor is God's image. And you will love him for that reason. Now think about the Lord Jesus Christ who in his humanity was anointed with the Spirit above measure. How did he love? That is the kind of love the Spirit of God produces and he gave us his Holy Spirit so that we would love in that same way as well. Now, as we saw earlier, this kind of love is what gives rise to faith because we see now in our Lord Jesus Christ who offers himself to us in the gospel as our Savior, when we were unconverted, when we saw that offer, we didn't want it because we didn't want him and we didn't want heaven and we wanted our sin, so we rejected him. But when the Spirit of God came into our lives, He showed us the beauty of Jesus. And that beauty is wrapped up in His moral purity and holiness, and we embraced Him. That's what Paul really talks about in Galatians 5, 6, I made reference to a little bit earlier, when he writes this, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, that is physically, but faith working through love. Love is really the, the enlivening operative principle within faith that makes it a living faith versus the dead faith that James talks about. Only a living faith can save, a living faith that moves us to do something that God calls us to do versus the dead faith that basically does nothing. It changes everything, okay? That view of God, this love of the Holy Spirit changes the way that we really view God in nature as far as how He reveals Himself to us in nature. As unbelievers, we tried to bury it. We tried to suppress it. We used our intellect to try to argue against it. But with the love of the Holy Spirit, now we receive it. His revelation of grace given to us in the gospel before we didn't want Jesus, now we love Him and we trust Him. But this love of the Holy Spirit also produces other fruits in, the lives, in our lives as well. By the way, examine yourself with regard to these things. It will produce a right belief, as we've already seen. We will believe in the right Jesus. We will believe in the true Jesus, and we will receive him and love him for what he is. Now I'm thinking about the letter that was written in the Bible to explain to us the whole purpose of the letter was given to us so that we might know that we have eternal life. And that's the, the letter of 1 John. And he points out in this letter that if we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, we can know we do because, first of all, we will have a right belief. We will believe in the true Jesus. We will believe in the Jesus who is fully God. John writes in 1 John 4.15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't be an unbeliever and believe that Jesus is God, but if you are a true believer, you must believe in the true Jesus. You also have to believe in the Jesus who is fully man. John writes in chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, 
By this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Now, John had to say that because of the Gnostic influence that denied the, that, that anything material could be good, that only spiritual things, immaterial things were actually good. And so they were denying that, that the Son of God could ever have become truly a man. But John says you have to believe that, and you will believe that if you have the Spirit of God living in you, if you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, he says we will, by the Spirit's influence, embrace everything that God says as true. 1 John 2, 27. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Now, he's not saying here the Spirit of God is going to become your personal teacher so you don't need to read the Bible. And he's going to communicate verbal inspiration to you all the time. But what he is saying is that when you read God's word and when you hear it taught, he will bear witness to the fact that that is God's truth and you will receive it as true because of the Spirit's work. And you will love it and you will embrace it. So this love will give you a sound belief in the truth. But it will, and this is, by the way, part of the fruit that is being born in, in the parable of the sower. But most of all, it will produce a right behavior. Uh, the letter of 1 John is full of this. He says, we will walk as Jesus walked in the light. 1 John 1, verses 6 and 7. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus' his son cleanses us from all sin. If we are born again of God, if we have the Spirit of God, we will walk in the light. We will have fellowship with one another. We will have fellowship with the Lord. This is simply another way of saying we will obey God's commandments. Chapter 2, verses 3 and 5. By this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. The one who says I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. He says we'll do this all the time. Chapter 2, verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. We will do this because we want to do it, not because God is putting the screws to us and threatening damnation if we don't, but we'll do it because we love him. And because we love his commandments, that's why John writes in chapter 5, verse 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. It's never a burden to do what you want to do, what you love to do. That's easy. The hard thing is doing what you don't want to do. And if the commandments are a burden, and they will be to some degree because we still have sin in us, you know, it doesn't mean we're unbelievers, but if they're just totally a burden to us, well, then we have to be concerned. But if we love the commandments and we keep them, we want to keep them, even though we fail, we get up and we try again, that shows us that we belong to Him. John goes on to say that we'll also love those who are brothers and sisters in the Lord because of what we see of Jesus being formed in them. In chapter 4, verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen and especially can't love the Lord Jesus Christ who is God in human flesh, the one who actually came into this world to reveal to us what the Father is like. On the opposite side of things, we won't love the world because the world is the opposite of God. Chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And again, he's not talking about the natural beauty of the world or even the beauty we see left over from the curse on the creation. He's talking about the world system, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, boastful pride of life. We will not practice sin. 
Well, like I said, we'll be practicing righteousness. You can't practice righteousness and sin at the same time. Chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. And you see, when he gives us the Holy Spirit, he breaks us free from the power of sin and he destroys the devil's work over us and his power in us. John also goes on to say that when we do sin, we will confess our sins, we will not deny our sins, and we will do everything in our power to put every sin to death and to put it off. Same thing Paul talked about in Romans chapter 8. If by the Spirit we were putting to death the sins of the body, we will live. John puts it this way. Chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as He is pure. So essentially, this trust in the Lord Jesus Christ this love for God and for the things of God and for the ways of God, this distaste of the world, these are all ways we can know that we belong to the Lord. These are essentially, I believe, a large part of the Spirit's testimony that Paul was talking about earlier in Romans chapter 8 that gives us assurance. Paul writes in Romans 8 verses 15 through 16, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, how does he do that? Well, I think it, it essentially works this way, that he is, even as he bears testimony to the word of God, that it is the truth of God, he also points out in our lives the, the evidences that, that we've just been reading about, these fruits, and the clearer we see these things and the more that we are assured by the Spirit of God that these are actually motivated by Him, by the love that He creates in our hearts for the Lord, the stronger our confidence will be to call God our Father because He is our Father. Peter puts it this way, that these things show that we have become partakers of the divine nature when we see that nature that character being formed in us, then we can know that we belong to Him. Now, John wrote his first letter, as I said, so that we can know that we belong to Jesus, 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Those of you who believe, those of you who believe that He is who He said He was and that you're, you're trusting in Him, I'm writing to you. This is how you can know that you have eternal life, that your trust is actually a saving trust, that you see this love for the truth. You see this love for what is right. You see within yourself doing what is right, and you see yourself breaking away from the things of the world. As a matter of fact, you've broken away from it, and you are trying to purify yourself from whatever is left over from it so that you might serve Him. If we belong to Him, we will see these things in ourselves. And to the degree we do, and know that they're motivated by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of love, we will have assurance. Now, if we were to stop right here, and we are going to stop here, but if, if we stopped here and didn't continue this this evening, one of, the, one of the issues that might arise from this is, haven't you painted or hasn't the Bible painted a very high picture of what a Christian should be? And if this is the standard, can any of us really be saved? Um, well, the problem is, because of the sin that's inside of us, we are still far from perfect. And because we are, the enemy of our souls can exploit our weaknesses and try to convince us that we really do not belong to the Lord at all. So what we're going to do this evening is we're going to look at some of the ways the enemy tries to exploit our weaknesses and tries to break our assurance so he can break us away from following the Lord and doing what he calls us to do and instead become introspective and focus on whether or not I'm going to go to heaven. If you're in that kind of a situation, it will cripple you. You need to know 
that you belong to Him so that you can do what He calls you uh, to do. Well, let's uh, bow, shall we, for a a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to um, search our hearts, give us grace to um, know whether or not we do belong to Him, and uh, thank Him if we do. And as we also spend some time in prayer, let's, let's also begin preparing ourselves to come to the table where we essentially are confessing Jesus again, confessing to one another that He is our only hope of heaven, that we are expressing to the Lord Jesus Christ our whole hope and trust is based upon His work. So let's prepare to renew our faith in the Lord Jesus, renew our covenant with Him, and uh, repent of, of our sins.